father that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. And please turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 22. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 18 to 22. 2 Corinthians 1, 18, this is God's word. But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by me, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him. For as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. May God bless the reading of his holy word. What the Gospel of Luke has been highlighting for us is our Lord's gracious acceptance of anyone and everyone who has a broken heart over their sin, anyone who is repentant over their sin, Anyone who's desirous to forsake that sin and trusts only in God's mercy for salvation. God accepts anyone that does that, no matter who they are, Pharisee, tax collector, prostitute, whoever. The Gospel of Luke has also been highlighting our Lord's opposition, his very strong opposition to false religion that misinterpreted or outright rejected the Old Testament scriptures that he himself had breathed forth to the people of Israel. Pharisaic Judaism was at this point in history, for the most part, completely apostate. And the word apostate means they had moved away from the truth. That Greek preposition apa means away from, apostate, to move away from the truth. They had turned the Old Testament testimony to all of mankind's need for supernatural grace and mercy from God. They turned all of it into a hollow shell of ritualism and formalism. This religion of human achievement and pseudo-law-keeping they had created had no life-transforming power whatsoever in it. It denied the simple teachings of God's law. Remember their Korban rule that they had invented, that any help that they were going to give to their parents, they could just give it to the temple, and then they were freed from their obligation to honor their father and mother. Jesus told them that clearly denied that commandment, the fifth commandment. Their Sabbath rules, we've gone over those a lot in Luke's gospel, they clearly violated the the heart of the Sabbath commandment. It it created restrictions that God had never given them, like you're not allowed to lift something that weighs more than a certain number of pounds, then you're violating the Sabbath. You're not allowed to walk a certain distance or you're violating the Sabbath. Their interpretation of the prohibition against adultery and their understanding of what gave someone the right to a divorce was also, we saw last week, completely anti-scriptural. But they didn't see it, and they didn't care. When Jesus pointed it out, pointed out these obvious things to them, they didn't care. These men who supposedly loved God and loved the God who gave them those Old Testament scriptures, they clearly did not love him, and they didn't know him either. They didn't love their neighbors. They didn't love their fellow man. They loved and served an idol, money. They loved their pride. They loved their position. They loved what they saw in the mirror every day, if they had mirrors back then. They didn't understand humility before God. They didn't understand how the Old Testament ought to have shown them how wicked and sinful they really were and how desperately they needed a Savior. That text of Scripture was was intended by God to show them that, but they hadn't seen it. Their hearts were dead and hardened. The same is true of anyone today who's not born again who tries to read the Bible. The Bible will always be a closed book until a person's born again. In his discussion of the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant order, Paul wrote this wonderful but haunting passage, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 14. He said about the Jewish people that didn't know Christ, he said, but their hearts were hardened. For until this very day, at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. 
But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And there are so many people, I've heard the testimonies of people who had read the Bible for years and years, but it wasn't until they were born again by God's Spirit, they finally understood these great things. They finally understood the gospel and the meaning of grace. The religion of the Pharisees, the religion of the Jewish people in Jesus' day, it brought about a whole slew of errors, a whole slew of improper attitudes. Number one, personal arrogance. If your religion leads to pride inherently, it's definitely wrong. Hence, Jesus told parables about scrambling for the best seats at feast. I mean, Jesus was so obvious. He had just been watching these people trying to get the best seats, and he tells them a parable about, don't do that. Jesus told that to combat their arrogance. It also created an environment where people were mistreated all the time. The Pharisees did not treat people with love or with mercy. Hence the three-part parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son that was intended to illustrate the joy in the heart of God when anybody repents. When the lost coin is found, the woman rejoices after sweeping her house. The the lost sheep is found, the the shepherd rejoices at the sheep and tells all of his neighbors. And the son, the, the prodigal son, when he comes home, the father runs down the road and takes the shame on himself and is so happy his son has come home and restores him to the position of son and has a feast to celebrate. They had false ways of getting into heaven. Remember the thing about attaining to the resurrection of the righteous? And they said, blessed is the man who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And Jesus tells them the parable of the big dinner, trying to let them know, you guys are not coming to the, to the wedding feast. You're not, you guys aren't coming to it. You guys are the ones who made all these lame excuses. You have all these religious practices. You guys didn't understand everything the Old Testament, the Bible I gave you was supposed to teach you. And now you're making excuses. Their attempts to establish their own righteousness by their obedience as opposed to resting only upon the mercy of God and only doing works in gratitude to God for that saving grace. It made them ignorant of the gospel. They didn't see it. They didn't understand it. And hence their excuses. I need to go look at a piece of land. I need to go look at my oxen I just bought, or I just got married. I I can't come to the big dinner. It also created wrong attitudes about money. They worshipped money. They were all about the social scene and inviting people who were rich to their parties and so they could be invited back to their parties so they could see and be seen. And hence Jesus tells the parable of the unrighteous manager, the individual that had been entrusted with, with money. And he points out how this person who's clearly wicked and ungodly Use that to create places for him to live for a few years before he died. And Jesus points out, you need to make friends in the other place. Invest your gifts, your time, your talents, so that people will welcome you, not into their homes here for a few years, but into the eternal dwellings. And he said at the very end of that, and the Pharisees took this right to the heart. He said, you can't serve God and money. You cannot do it. The Pharisees tried to serve both. Jesus said, no one is able to serve both. And that's what angered the Pharisees so much. Jesus unmasked them again and again and demonstrated their hypocrisy, demonstrated their wickedness, their love of everything except for God and the truth. And for this reason, they wanted to kill him. Pharisees even conspired with their mortal enemies, the Herodians. I mean, the Pharisees of all people absolutely abominated anyone associated with Rome. Unless they'll help us kill Jesus. Then you guys are our friends. We'll conspire with you about him even though we can't stand you. Wrong attitudes toward people was illustrated by the parable of the lost coin, the sheep, and the lost son. God rejoices when anyone repents. Isn't that encouraging to know? It doesn't matter what your past, where you've been, what you've been up to. It doesn't matter how much you've buried yourself in iniquity and unrighteousness. When anyone repents and comes to Christ, God rejoices. There is no reluctance about welcoming them into the kingdom whatsoever, even if they think there is reluctance about it. Remember the parable of the prodigal son? What did he think? Well, maybe he'll let me live in the servants' quarters. No way is he going to ever let me be a son again. He, even he didn't understand how gracious his father really was. But you see, On the basis of Christ and his work, he can welcome the most vile people into his house as sons and daughters. And now Jesus tells a parable illustrating the rich man in the last parable who neglected to make friends with his money, who will welcome him into the eternal dwellings when he died, who likewise neglected to love the poor diseased man, Lazarus, who'd been thrown at his gate. Now he tells a parable illustrating, here's where they go when they die. 
I mean, Jesus goes from one thing, stop being so prideful, stop misusing money, stop, stop mistreating people and thinking you're better than them. And then this last parable before we get on to some more discourses in Luke 17, now it's, okay, Pharisees, listen, this is where you're going. You're going to hell when you die. That's why this morning we're not actually going to walk through this parable. It was reflecting on the doctrine of hell. I want you to know, hell, the people in hell, seems like most of them are real surprised to be there. Most of them are shocked when they awaken in that place. Hell's surprised guests. Hell will have many people in it that didn't think they were going to go there. Why is that? Because the actual path to hell in this life has a sign over the top of it that says heaven ahead. And a lot of people walk on it, not realizing it's going to hell. The path to destruction, which many travel on, it says deceptively, of course, that it's the path to heaven. And those that are traveling on the path to hell announce to others that they're on the path to heaven. And many believe them. But it's not. Jesus is here again. He's going to work real hard in this parable to let the rich Pharisees, these lovers of money, he calls them, know that in fact they're going to go to hell when they die. Now think about the order of all these parables once again. Pharisees and those devoted to their false religions, wrong attitude towards people, wrong attitude toward money, wrong attitude for who's going to heaven to the resurrection of the just, and a wrong attitude to the law of God. Enter the parable that shows what happens when such people die. They go to hell. No human being, biblical prophet, or author of scripture ever said more about hell than Jesus of Nazareth. No one did. Jesus affirmed hell's existence as a real place which real people went to forever. It's an odd thing to consider, but nearly everybody in society, whether they ever go to church or not, everybody wants to affirm the reality of heaven. Everyone wants to think there's a real heaven. Remember the movie Field of Dreams? Remember that movie Field of Dreams? Kevin Costner's character asks the baseball player who's supposedly in a baseball field in heaven, is there a heaven? And Shoeless Joe Jackson says, oh yeah. It's the place dreams come true. That's a lie. <laughs> it's a lie. As if, yeah, and we're all going there. We're all going there together. Just like the Pharisee. Blessed is the man who eats bread in the kingdom of God. And Jesus keeps trying to let him know, yeah, that's certainly true, but none of you guys are going to be there. It's an odd thing. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Many who profess to believe the Bible deny the reality of hell. Weird, isn't it? One author wrote this, quote, Throughout his ministry, Jesus taught that the lost world would depart into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels and eternal punishment. In other words, they will suffer endless conscious agony away from the presence of God and his son. None of the other options that confuse the evangelical spectrum are viable in the light of Jesus' view of eternal punishment. There's no escaping it. There's just no way of getting around it. Now, what to say first to you, there are emotional difficulties with the doctrine of hell but they are only emotional. They're only emotional on our end. God's justice is never severe. It's never arbitrary either. It's always perfect, and it's strict in accordance with the truth. Justice and God's holiness demands a day of reckoning on human sinfulness. Sin must be dealt with, and it will be dealt with. Why is the doctrine of hell so much a part of Jesus' teaching and his ministry? Why why did he talk about hell so often? Okay, you ready? Here's why. To terrify people to terrify them about the fate that awaits them if they die unrepentant and still in their sins. Jesus told the Jews at the Feast of Tabernacles, John 8, 24, he told them, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. This is why the Apostle Paul had continual grief in his heart for his fellow Jews As he says in Romans chapter 9, so many of them had rejected the gospel just as they had rejected Christ and his life on earth. Paul says in Romans 9 too, he says, I have continual grief in my heart. He was grieved all the time thinking about where they were going to go when they died. He even makes the amazing statement, Romans 9, 3, I could wish that I myself were accursed and separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul grieved and sorrowed. Why? Because hell is real. When it comes to the doctrine of hell, it is not compassionate to downplay it. 
It's not kind to ignore it. It's not loving to push it aside. Warning people about hell is compassionate and it's merciful. Peter warned his hearers in Acts chapter 2 to be saved from this perverse generation. When we pray at 5 o'clock down there in that fellowship hall, there's a feeling of deep emotion in our hearts when we pray. Why? Because we're Christ's disciples and therefore we believe what his word says about this particular point. And the thought of people that we love suffering in hell makes us really, really sad. But for believers in false gospels, false ways of attaining heaven, false views of God's love for repentant people, lovers of money, and devotees of false religions, hell is a truth that is in every way inescapable. Why did Jesus die? Think about it. Why was he nailed to a cross? Why did he lay his life down in that place? To save his people from their sins. Save them from what? From hell. Jesus is the only way anyone can be saved from going to hell. And one must repent and believe in Jesus alone as the one whose righteousness they stand in and whose cross sacrifice pays the full penalty of their sins against God. Or such a person will die under God's curse and hear those terrible words, depart from me, you cursed ones. Into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. It's a biblical truth taught repeatedly as well as that for many, many people who end up in hell, their being there will come as a huge shock to them. Listen to just a couple passages. Matthew 7, 22. Jesus said, many will come on that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons, in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Many will come. Lord, Lord, we're here. Let us in. No, I don't know who you are. Matthew 25, 44. Then they themselves on the day of judgment will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or, or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Luke 13, we already saw this one, Luke 13, 25. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open to us. And he will answer and say to you, I don't know where you're from. And you'll begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. I was thinking about the rich man there in hell. It's such a terrifying thing. Being in agony, what does he want? Go, go back and warn my brothers about this place. Warn the people I love about this place. It's too late for me. But he was in agony. In agony. I want you to know how to make sure you don't end up there with him. I want you to know how you can make sure you don't end up there with them. One of the most glorious teachings of the Bible, of the wonderful things that God has spoken to us, is the teaching on assurance of grace and salvation. It is the normal condition of a true believer to know that they have eternal life. After writing this introduction to this parable, I decided I'm gonna, I'm gonna save walking through the parable until we cover this important topic. How can I know personally that I have eternal life and that I will not awaken in hell in shock? How can I know infallibly, certainly, that I will go to heaven when I die? You know, we've had a lot of illness in, in church here recently, and, you know, we've had some illness in my house the last couple of years, and when you're really, really ill, I know you all think about it. You think about death and dying. You think about, am I really, really right with God? Those illnesses are there to, to stir that thought to make sure your hope rests only on Christ and nothing else. Consider the rich man in this parable and the frightening plight that he finds himself in and the fact there's no way out of it. The door has been shut. Once you're dead, the door's shut forever. Right now it's open. Right now it's open. You have life. You're still alive. The foundation of Christian assurance of salvation is the divine truth, the promises of salvation along with the inward evidences of those graces under which those promises are made. Now, I want to talk to you about that, what the Bible means by this. It's often a surprising thing to consider, but for true believers to doubt their salvation, for true believers to lack full assurance, is sinful. It's a sin not to have full assurance if you are a true believer. Because when the one true and living God speaks and makes a promise, there's nothing imaginable that is more certain than that promise. 
to escape the wrath and the curse of God due to us for our sin, we need to repent and we need to believe the gospel. And it's one thing to say that you have done, done those things, repented and believed. It's a very different thing to know that you've done both. And next Sunday morning, we're taking the Lord's Supper. I'm going to preach a sermon on the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a great means of assurance. It's a great means of showing you the gospel was achieved outside of you. It has nothing to do with anything going on inside of you. It was achieved by Christ outside of you. That's what makes it certain. Now remember, since sin came into the world, since sin came into the hearts of men, we have all become inherently untrustworthy. We are all untrustworthy. When you go to your car, when you go to your house, when you go to your bank, you find vivid physical reminders of human untrustworthiness in the existence of of locks. Would you buy a car that didn't have locks on it? How about a house it, that the front door it doesn't lock? How about a bank that just stores all of its money out in plain view for the whole world? Why do you have to have that? Because humans exist, and they will take all your stuff if you don't lock it up. We all know, because we know the evil in our own hearts, that people are generally untrustworthy. Why do we have to have written contracts when we have big deals like, for example, selling a house. Can't we just shake hands and take each other's word for it? No. Because of sin, human beings have to take every conceivable precaution to protect themselves from the untrustworthiness of other human beings. Such should not be the case among Christian people, of course. Our yes should be yes and our no should be no. Why? Because that's the character of our God. We're to be like him. If we're to be like Christ, then what we say we're going to do, we do. What we promise to do, we do. We're to imitate that holiness. God's yes is always yes, and his no is no. God's word is the most trustworthy source of truth in existence. And with people, we often get yes and no. We often experience betrayal, forgetfulness, or outright lies. With God, however, there is only truthfulness, and there is only absolute faithfulness to what he promised. Now let's walk through 2 Corinthians 1, 18-22, while tying in a number of other passages so we can see the wonderful truth that any person who owns their sin, who says is a sin what God's word says is a sin in their life, confesses it, grieves over it, repents of it, and puts their hope in Christ, they can know beyond a shadow of a doubt, infallibly, that they will go to heaven when they die. They can know that they are saved. Okay, look at verse 18. But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no, says Paul. As was pointed out earlier in this chapter in 2 Corinthians, Paul had intended to visit the Corinthian congregation, but was providentially hindered from doing so. Paul had told them, I'm going to come see you guys, I'm going to come visit you, but then he was not able to. The enemies of the apostles, who sadly seem to be everywhere, they took this as an opportunity to discredit Paul's gospel message that he had preached. Can you believe that? They said, hey, this guy said he's coming to visit you, and obviously his word means nothing. He said he's going to come see you, therefore what he preached to you about Jesus, it likewise means nothing. Paul is a yes and no kind of guy. He talks out of both sides of his deceptive mouth. And Paul is very quick to explain why he had not visited them. He had been providentially hindered. But then he responds to any idea that this providential delay in his visit should take away from the absolute truth of what he had preached to them concerning Jesus Christ and the gospel. It should strike us that Paul is laboring here, writing by the direct intervention of the Holy Spirit of God to assure the Corinthian congregation that the promises of the gospel are absolute and certain, that in Jesus Christ, all of God's promises of saving, forgiving, and justifying sinners are yes and amen. Now listen, please. Isn't it amazing that an alleged failure on the part of a minister of the gospel Paul's not being able to visit Corinth when he said he was going to try. An alleged breaking of his word, a sin on his part, so-called, would be used to try to undermine the credibility of God's promises. Has anything changed? What happens anytime a pastor falls or a high-profile Christian leader commits some kind of serious sin? How many people walk away from God altogether because of the failure of a leader or of a preacher? Our belief is in God's promises, our faith rests on Christ, not the people who preach Christ. 
Paul begins in verse 18, but as God is faithful, not as I am faithful or as, or as the other apostles are faithful or as Christian people are faithful, but as God is faithful. You know the world's most famous geyser? The world's most famous geyser, it currently erupts about 20 times a day, and they can predict with a 90% confidence rate within 10 minutes a variation based on the duration and height of the previous eruption when it's going to erupt. And because of that, it's known as what? Old faithful. Old faithful. We live in a world characterized by broken promises, by lies, and overall unfaithfulness on the part of people. It's very difficult to find a, a faithful man, a faithful woman. Proverbs 20, verse 6. Most men will proclaim each his own goodness if you sit them down and interview them. Are you a faithful person? Yeah. But who can really find a faithful man, it says. It's very difficult to find those kinds of people. If people are willing to be labeled, if people are, are willing to label a fairly regular, fairly predictable geyser old faithful, that's a bit of a cheap usage of the word, isn't it? When scripture applies the word faithful to God, it means that God is trustworthy to fulfill what he has promised, and he never fails to do so. Here in 2 Corinthians 1, 18, Paul is directing all attention to the faithfulness of God himself. He says, as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. So I want you to consider with me, please, God's faithfulness. This is the first and strongest ground of our assurance of grace and of salvation. If your faith is in Jesus, in his shed blood at the cross, and you're relying only on him for your salvation, God has forgiven you of your sins. Jesus said you have eternal life. That's God's promise. And God is faithful to that promise. In fact, the Westminster Confession rightly describes that assurance as, listen, I love this, not as a bare conjectural and probable persuasion grounded on a fallible hope. So you don't answer the question, yeah, I ho hope so. You going to heaven? Yeah, I hope so. I, I really hope so. When you're asked, are you going to heaven when you die? Yes. Wow, how can you be so sure? Because it has nothing to do with me. Because it has everything to do with what Jesus did and nothing I have done. I'm receiving and resting on him and nothing else. And that's why I have infallible assurance of faith founded on a divine promise from the God who is always faithful and never lies. That's the first and strongest ground of our assurance of grace and of salvation. In fact, our confession describes this certainty as not a bare conjecture. What, what is a conjecture? It's thinking something might be true based on scanty evidence. I'm, I'm conjecturing this or that, but rather it's infallible because it's based on an infallible God who makes infallible promises. In Joshua 23, 14, after they settled in the promised land, we're told that when it came to what God promised them, not one word failed. There's only one being who is inherently always trustworthy, who always tells the truth, and whose promises are absolutely certain with no possibility of failure. And if we truly believe the promises that he makes to save us from our sins, and the rich man in hell and the Pharisees did not believe those promises, what did they believe? They believed by our good works, done with the help of God, we can earn a place for ourselves in heaven. That's why they went to hell. But if you believe it's Christ and him alone at the cross that was for me, for my sin against God, and I'm not going to add anything to it ever, I'm only going to rest upon him, then those promises are ours, and they are absolutely sure. Now how does faith do that? How does belief in Jesus really justify us? Is there something virtuous about faith? Not at all. One theologian said this, it's never on account of its formal nature as believing that faith is conceived of in Scripture to be saving. It is not, strictly speaking, even faith in Christ that saves, but Christ who saves through faith. The saving power resides exclusively not in the act of faith, but in the object of faith. It's not my believing that saves me, it's the one I believe in who saves me. Jesus Christ saves me. Faith simply lays hold of Christ. Martin Luther, uh, the illustration I've shared with you, I love it because it captures it so perfectly. Luther said, it's not even the strength of your faith. The tiniest little bit of faith can save you or justify you, just like a really strong faith can save or justify you because it's not the faith that counts. It's what your faith is resting on that counts. Luther said, if two men have 100 gold coins, one in a steel safe and the other in a wet paper sack, 
they both still have 100 gold coins. It doesn't matter how strong or how weak your faith is. People have asked, how much faith do you have to have in Jesus to be justified? And the response is, any. Any. Romans 4, 16, therefore justification is by faith so that it might be according to grace, so that the promise would be sure. Justified by faith in Christ, by what he has done, so that we're saved by grace, not by anything that we've done. To truly believe the gospel means you relinquish, you let go of all reliance upon yourself and anything you've done to be saved. The Pharisees didn't want to do that. They had too much built into their system. They had invested too much time into doing all these works They couldn't let go of that. They couldn't pronounce a curse on their works the way the Apostle Paul did. A former Pharisee. Remember Philippians chapter 3 where he lists out his resume? All the stuff that he had done he thought was going to get him into heaven. He realized it was rubbish, it was dung, it was garbage. To believe is to be convinced, is to have certainty. Paul says in 2 Timothy 1, 12, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. He knew he was going to heaven. He couldn't wait to get there. He couldn't wait to get there. When he was in jail and wrote Philippians, to depart and be with Christ is far better. He said, I can't wait to go to heaven. And Paul says, as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. What he's saying is that the content of the message they preached and the promises that they made, that all who repent and believe the gospel, it's not fickle, it's not changeable, it is as faithful as God himself is. Those promises are as certain as God's being God. Look at verse 19. For the Son of God Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but, in, but is yes in him. We very often underestimate how serious of a sin it is for us to break promises, to break oaths, to break our word. Remember what Jesus taught about the seriousness of that in Matthew 5, 34? I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair black or white, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Remember the Pharisees? They had a whole great gradation of things you could swear by. And it would obligate you to various degrees of faithfulness. If you swore by the temple, swore by your head, swore by your hair, if you had hair, swear by the the city of the great king, swear by Jerusalem, swear by this, swear by that. That was like varying degrees of how faithful you had to be to what you said. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you say you're going to do something, make sure you do it. In this particular section of of James chapter 5, James 5 verse 12 says, Above all, my brethren, do not swear. Above all, don't swear. In that particular section, he just said, greed is wrong, stealing is wrong, murdering the just is wrong, grumbling is wrong. And then he says, but above all, and you think it's going to be something real big here, he's going to say, above all, my brethren, don't swear. Isn't that amazing? Above all, don't swear. Remember the commandment? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. If we take a solemn oath and make a promise invoking the name of God, it is a very serious matter. Breaking that oath is taking God's name in vain. Men are fickle. We're good at rationalizing the breaking of oaths and and often downright wicked in, in what we say and what we promise. In fact, we even have to have lawyers who are experts at contract law. But why do we take oaths? Why do we make promises? Why do we have sacred vows swearing by someone greater than ourselves because we are fickle and because we are yes and no creatures. We are sinful and untrustworthy. But see verse 19? Verse 19, the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, he was the center and substance of the message that Paul preached. And that's what Paul was preaching to the Corinthians. In his first letter, in chapter 2, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians, he said, I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, but proclaimed only Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that's the message that's central to the gospel. Forgiveness of sins and a perfect righteousness legally imputed to our account, not by works of law, not by things that we do, but by simple belief in the Son of God. 
When we remember God's dealings with Israel throughout their entire history, he always made good on all his promises. When we remember the conception of Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary, that was God making good on his promise. In fact, when the Virgin Mary sings her Magnificat in Luke chapter 1, at the very end of it she says, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Mary understood this is what the faithfulness of God had brought to pass. She had the Christ child in her womb who would save her from her sins. Why was there a child in her womb who did not have a human father? Because God is yes and amen always to what he promised. And Mary knew that she was with child because God is faithful. When we remember Jesus, remember at the point once he's confessed to be the Christ, it says in Luke that he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Why did he do that? Why was he determined to go to Jerusalem? Because he was passionate to fulfill the mission for which he came. To save his people from their sins. And to present them faultless before his Father in heavenly glory. Why did Jesus stand silent before false accusations? Why did Jesus quietly allow Roman soldiers to scourge his body? To take his garments and to divide them and then to nail him to a cross? Why did Jesus lay his life down on that cross so that in that climactic moment, the fallen would be forever committed to the word of God? When Jesus received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. It is paid in full. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. That alone is why we're going to heaven. That's what the rich man didn't believe. And that's what, if you believe, you can know it is finished. It's paid in full. No accusation can ever be brought against you again for eternity. Not ever. Look at verse 20. For as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. God makes these wonderful promises of saving grace to us. I have a question. Do you believe them? Do you believe those promises? When you read them in Scripture, do you believe they're for you? When Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, and you who were dead in your trespasses and sins, you he made alive in Christ. By grace are you saved. Do you read that and say, that's me. That's me. I was dead in my sins, and God made me alive in Christ. Romans 4, 6. Listen to the word of God. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not charge sin. Are you the blessed person there? Are you the blessed man? Do you say with joy when you hear that, I am the blessed man of Romans 4, 6 through 8. Christ's righteousness is imputed to me apart from works and my sins will never be charged against me because they were charged against Jesus in my place. All of them. The two stanzas of of the great hymn, Standing on the Promises. Listen to the opening two stanzas. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. You know what that's talking about? The howling storms of doubt and fear. Have you been through the howling storms of doubt and fear lately? You stand on the promises that cannot fail. By the living word of God, I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I now can see perfect, present cleansing in the blood for me. Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free, standing on the promises of God. The scriptures give us other ways that we can have that assurance, but the firmest ground upon which our hope of heaven must always rest is the divine truth of the promises of salvation. Imagine the man who repented there on the cross in agony, next to Jesus, who had been reviling him before, cursing him before with the other guy. All of a sudden, God makes him born again. All of a sudden, he's born again. What does he say? Lord, remember me. And he admits to the other guy, don't you fear God, seeing we're under the same condemnation? And then he realizes, and we indeed justly. Imagine being nailed to a cross and thinking, this is righteous, this is just. I am getting what I deserve. And then right next to the Christ, the Messiah, the seed of the woman, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus gives him the ultimate assurance, today you will be with me in paradise. 
today you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that encouraging? Finally, verse 21 and 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. In this text, that term establishes is a present ongoing action on God's part. He is ever at work establishing us more and more upon the foundation of his promises. The rest of the verbs there describe simple past tense things. He has anointed us. He has sealed us. He's given us his spirit who is the guarantee who is the pledge of God, like the down payment on buying a house. The indwelling of the Spirit of God is the one who causes us to cry out in prayer, Abba, Father, when we're burdened. The indwelling Holy Spirit is he who brings about those fruits of love, joy, peace, and long-suffering, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. The indwelling Spirit is the one who sets the true believer apart from the unbeliever. Now what's communicated in that word established there? It's the idea of firm security. He who establishes you. We are now firmly planted, established upon the rock. Before we were born again, before we were united to Christ, we were like a a ship adrift at sea, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and by the the biggest storms ever were capsizing us and we're getting ready to sink. But now God has chained us to the firmest anchor imaginable, which no storm, wind, or disaster can ever break or move because it's been firmly attached to us by God. One of the great biblical themes that illustrates so well the new position that we have in Christ is the theme of adoption. You realize in ancient times, adoptions could never be undone. Once you adopted that person and the verdict came down, adopted, the gavel came down, you're stuck with that person forever. There's been a definitive change in ownership over us. We were once orphans. We were once enslaved to the sin nature and to the will of Satan, to the course of this world. Even Jesus told his enemies that they were of their father, the devil. Their father, the devil, saying, you're the children of the one you serve, Satan. But for the believer, we're of Christ now. We're of God. We're the children of the Lord. Christ has broken the chains and taken us to be his own. Jesus, the strong man, has has bound Satan and has taken away some of his goods, namely us, and made us his own. So remarkable is this divine transaction of adoption. The Bible says in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together with him. So, dear congregation, please, knowing you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit and a joint heir of the entire redeemed, created cosmos with Christ, knowing that, that's what it means to be established. When 2 Corinthians 1.21 here, here says in that last phrase that we are anointed, it's speaking of the Holy Spirit of God taking up residence within us. We are anointed with the Spirit. An anointed gives us the image of the anointing oil, which was the common way of Scripture in referring to being filled with the Holy Spirit. We've been anointed by the Spirit. The Spirit of God indwelling us is the means by which we've been sealed. Sealed, marked out for the day of redemption. His indwelling presence in us is the guarantee of our redemption. Ephesians 1, 13, Scripture says, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's like God has put the wax on you in his signet ring. You've been sealed. You're owned by him now. The Spirit of God is the down payment guaranteeing the redemption of our bodies to the praise of his glory. Next Sunday, I want to preach about the Lord's Supper right before we take the Lord's Supper. The Sunday after that, I want to take up the question, how can we know that we're indwelt by the Spirit? What are the What are the fruits and evidences that we are indeed children of God? Uh, No questions could be more important than that. You think you got problems? You think you got things going on in life right now? I assure you, nothing's more important than that. How can we know that we're in the favor of God? The first way is believe the promises of salvation. When Scripture calls you a sinner, agree with it. That's what the word confess in Greek means. Hamalageo, same speaking. You speak the same thing. What God says is a sin, I say is a sin. If he says I'm a sinner, I say I'm a sinner too. And if he says Jesus died upon the cross and that's my only hope, then that's what I'm going to trust in. That phrase in Luke 16, 23 just gave me the chills. I was going through 
writing my sermon, in Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. He, he's, and he's, he's shocked. He's surprised to be there. And there's tension here because Romans 1.32 says that the unbeliever, they know that they're worthy of death. They, they not only keep doing the stuff that they know is wrong, but they, they encourage others to do it too. We're also told in Scripture that men suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So there's a sense in which they, they hold that truth down and they, they push it aside and are deceived. 2, Corinthians, or 2 Thessalonians 2.10 says that there are those who don't receive a love of the truth so as to be saved. And for that reason, it says God will send upon them a strong delusion so they'll believe a lie. But the occupants of hell, when they're described in Scripture, they seem to be surprised. Lord, Lord, what... what? Why aren't we being led into heaven? They're shocked by it. I don't want that to happen to any of you. The occupants of hell are shocked to be there. It's amazing. It's one of the most sobering prophecies in Scripture, but they're actually going to stand there on the day of judgment and argue with Jesus about it. Before they're sent to hell, they're going to fuss and fight and argue with him about it. Isn't that incredible? Deception follows people past this life into the next life, too. They're going to argue with them. Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Open to us. We ate and drank in your presence. Depart from me, he says. You cursed ones, depart. You who practice lawlessness, depart. You who are not dressed in my righteousness. Those of you who never admitted that you were a sinner and trusted only in me, I don't know you. True repentant believers in Christ put their hope of heaven only in him. It, it would never occur to a true believer to put their trust in their works. Lord, didn't I do this? Lord, didn't I do that? Never think that. When you think about death, I want you to think about one thing, the personal work of Jesus Christ. That's all. Didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? No. Everything you did, this or that, even in his name, was stained with enough sin for you to still go to hell. Your hope has to rest on Christ or you don't have him. It has to rest on Christ alone or you don't have him. Lord, didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? Didn't I help this person? Wasn't I kind to that person? Christians live and die trusting only in Jesus' shed blood and righteousness. And the life of godliness that they live is their sacrifice of gratitude to God. It's motivated by thankfulness. It's not motivated by a desire to save ourselves by those works. That just shows we don't understand how serious sin is. And we don't understand the perfection of what Jesus did. Christians have peace with God through Jesus Christ. That peace with God... Once it is gotten by faith alone, it starts a war with sin that will go on the rest of your life, and it's exhausting and it's difficult. Jesus said it perfectly when it comes to what we live and serve for. He said you can't serve two masters. And when that change happens, there's, there's a rewiring. that We now hate sin, and we love the Lord, and yet that sin is still there. Doesn't that drive you crazy if you're a Christian? Why is that rebellious tendency still there? You can't serve God in wealth. You can't be devoted to Jesus and to sin. So I want to say in closing to you, please admit that what God calls sin is sin. It doesn't matter what our culture says. It doesn't matter what liberal apostate churches say. It only matters what God has said in his word. What he calls a sin is still a sin. And it still excludes people from heaven if they don't repent of it. Don't listen to the counsel of the ungodly. All around you, don't listen to them. Confess as sin what God calls sin, hate it as sin, and believe God's promises of a full and perfect salvation. The thought of any of you being in hell is terrible. God's promises are yes and amen in only one place, Christ. You know, when Luther discovered the gospel again in Scripture, that what God demands in the law he freely provides to us in the gospel. And we don't receive it by working for it. We receive it by simply trusting that he did it for us. His mentor there in that Augustinian monastery said, Luther, if you take away indulgences and you take away Mary and you take away pilgrimages and you take away purgatory and saints and the mass and good works, what's left? What will you put in their place? And Luther said, Christ. A man only needs Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. It always has been. It always will be. Please, please, please believe it. Let's pray. 
Our God and Father, we are so blessed to be able to refer to you as our Father because you've adopted us into your family. You've taken care of the guilt of our sin in Christ. You have justified us and adopted us as your sons and daughters if we repent and believe in you. We pray if there are any here that are not yet born again, would you make today the day of their salvation, the day that they turn their back on their works, on religious observances, their piety, their holiness, and cause them to rest only on Jesus Christ. I pray this in his name. Amen.